Uh, we're so glad for another opportunity, another Sunday, beautiful day that God give us, another opportunity to gather and to worship the Lord and to experience his presence through his, uh, through, uh, through his spirit and be challenged by his word. And though you will hear his word for the very first time, uh, the Lord already preached it to me uh, during the time that I prepared it. And so I believe as it encouraged me and challenged me that it will do the same for you as well. Well, over the past uh, several Sundays now, we've been in a series on the book of James, and uh, the title of the series is A Roadmap for Faith. And if you haven't had a chance, I encourage you, if you haven't had a chance to go or to listen to the previous messages, whether online or here in the building, I encourage you to go back on our website, Facebook page, where it might be, YouTube channels, and uh, go back and watch them. Not to be entertained, there's lots of things you can be entertained by today, and we don't want to entertain you, but we want to ensure that you're equipped and encouraged and challenged to live out the truths and the principles that's contained in his word. And today I want to continue on in this series with part six uh, and, uh, and dive into a portion of scripture from James chapter five. James chapter five. Let's pray. Father, I just pray over your word, very simply, that you would have your way. Let your will be done in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Reading today from James 5, verse 7, down to verse, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 11. And here's what it says. Give a little bit of feedback, my brother. It says, therefore, be patient, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, uh, being patient about it until he gets, it gets the early and late rains. It says, you too be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brothers and sisters, against one another. That could be a whole other message right there, just that one verse. Uh, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brothers and sisters, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. It says, we count those blessed, the final verse here, who endured. Uh, you have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Amen? Amen. Well, for those of you who's in the room, those of you who will tune in online and watch this, uh, maybe you're here and you don't know much about James. Let me introduce him to you. Uh, he wrote the book of James, of course. Uh, but James is a very interesting person. He was the half-brother of Jesus. Some of this we already covered, but I just want to bring it back up again. And I often say to many of you as you're coming in, <clears throat> as your connections pastor, I often say, you know, we're, we're family. It's so good to see you. We're family. And what I mean by that is even though we may have different parents, uh, we're family because we have the same Heavenly Father. Amen? And, uh, but, you know, in this case, in James' life, when we look at the relationship between James and Jesus, we see that he was the half-brother of Christ because though they had the same mother, they didn't have the same father. For while James was the son of Joseph, Jesus uh, was the son of uh, God through the power of the Spirit, and, which is revealed in Matthew's gospel. He was not conceived by normal reproductive means. <clears throat> we'll get into that. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, he was and is the son of God, the second person of the Trinity and is divine. That's a whole other message. We'll get into that too as well. And so uh, he was Jesus' half-brother, but we also know that he was the leader of the Jerusalem church. We see that in Acts 15 as he gave leadership at a Jerusalem, con uh, Jerusalem conference and also in Acts 21. Uh, we see that when Paul visited that city in Jerusalem, it was to James uh, that he brought greetings and a special love offering was given uh, to him. He oversaw it to the Gentiles. And so there's further evidence. We can go through the scriptures. We won't have time for that today, but you, I'll leave that in your own Bible study time. Uh, that point to his leadership in the church. And as a leader, he's writing to believers that were a part of his church who had been scattered and moved outwards to various places because of uh, persecution that they were facing. And one scholar says James had formerly been in their, their spiritual leader. And so as such, he wrote to them with rightful spiritual authority and with full knowledge of their needs. 
They also note, the scholar notes that difficulties were confronting them. The ungodly rich were oppressing them. The religion of some was becoming a superficial uh, formality. Discriminatory practices were revealed, revealed a lack of love and bitterness and speech and attitude marred their fellowship. And so as he heard all about all these problems among all those scattered, he responds and writes in, uh, to urge them to make needed changes in their lives and in their relationships with one another and ultimately that would affect the relationship with God. We also know in addition to being the half-brother of Christ and in addition to being a leader in the church, he is self-described in James 1 and 1 as a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we, we mentioned this, I think Pastor Justin mentioned this point last week that you know, considering who he was and considering the relationship he had with Christ as his half-brother it speaks really to uh, the level of his spiritual maturity. Uh, uh, to him, for him to have such faith and, and confidence in Jesus' lordship uh, considering, like I said, that he grew up with him and knew him best. How many know you, you, your brothers and sisters, for those of you who have siblings, they know you best. They know you at your worst. They know you at your best. And, and you know, Jesus uh, and James, you know, James knew him and knew who he was and, um, and, and said he is Lord. And so James is writing to encourage and direct and give leadership over those who were scattered all over the place. And who had been pushed out from their homes and who were in desperate, desperate need of spiritual um, guidance, spiritual support, and even correction. As we learned over the past few Sundays, and I, like I said, I encourage you, if you haven't, and even if you have, go back and re-listen to these sermons. Uh, James in, those, in these messages, and we, we, I mean, we could spend a, a year on James. James is so chock full with so much stuff, but he presents such a, um, a multiplicity of messages that, that touches on a variety of subjects that we covered, such as how to respond uh, when difficult seasons uh, come in your life and, and challenge your faith. Uh, and your faith is put to the test. He talks about how to live out your faith in a very pragmatic and practical way, day by day. How to use godly wisdom in every circumstance in life. How to have a humble and selfless attitude that, uh, so that our relationships with one another and our relationship with God is where it's supposed to be. And like we said, James presents here uh, in, his, in, his, in his letter, uh, presents um, a roadmap for making our faith work. Uh, James does not really, uh, James does not um, focus on what theologians refer to as orthodoxy, which is right belief or right doctrine, in so much as he focuses on orthopraxy, which is about right belief or right, uh, sorry, right behavior or right practice of what you believe. And so much of the content in James is about the relationship between faith and works and with a focus on the latter, which, uh, with a focus on putting your faith and our faith into action. And personally, when I think of the book of James, I don't know about you, if you're familiar with it or you're not familiar with it, for me, when I think of James, immediately James 2.26 comes to mind, which says this, for just as the body without, um, without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Pretty strong language, but it gets the point across. You see, James is not a philosopher. James is a pragmatist. He's not a, uh, he's not a dreamer, but he's a doer. He's not all talk, but he's a person who walks the talk on a daily basis. <clears throat> and that comes out in his writing. As you read through the book of James, that comes over in his writing over and over again as he focuses more on the practice of our faith or, or the practical results of our faith, uh, because those whom he were writing to were also were already of the faith. They already were uh, believers. They, he didn't need to convince them, <clears throat> excuse me, to believe. He needed to convince them to act on what they believed. Which that's a challenge sometimes. They had already come to faith in Christ. But how many know that we are a work in progress? Am I the only one here this morning? That's a work in progress. He's still working on me, the little kids' course. We used to sing it, to make me what I ought to be. And, and there are times when we need some reminders to sort of set us back on the right course uh, towards a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ and fulfilling what Christ expects of all those who follow him, who call him Lord and Savior. And so in the portion of Scripture that we read earlier, James gives an exhortation to these scattered saints 
and the suffering saints for them to practice patience in the midst of pain, to practice patience in response to suffering. Now, if we were to be honest this morning, we can be transparent and say that patience and pain uh, are two things that, for the most part, that we do not really enjoy want in our lives. Uh, some people have more patience than others. Some people have a higher tolerance of pain than others. But no matter what you can handle today, these two things are something that, like I said, we don't generally want in our lives. And I know, I can't speak about you, but I know in my life, if I were to be transparent, my level of patience is just as high as my level of metabolism, all right? All right, you can joke about that. You can laugh about that, all right? It's nothing, it's quite, anyways, I'm there. Uh, my, you know, my level of patience is very low. You know what I'm saying? It's like a, the battery's drained out. Especially if I've got to put something together that you need the gift of interpretation for. Now, I operate in the gift of discernment quite often, but, you know, when you, when you, when you have to use that gift, uh, you know, I, my patience runs low. My son loves the Titanic. He's, he loves science stuff. He loves, he loves stuff about planets. and He loves everything, but especially loves the Titanic. And so we got them this little model kit. It's not a Lego kit. Um, it's, it's a different name than a Lego kit, but it got all the same things, except that it's about five times as as less, as big. It's a little, it's really, really small. I had to use, uh, what do you call those things? Tweezers. tweezers. Thank you, Crystal. I had to use tweezers trying to put this thing together because my fingers, I just couldn't get my, you know what I'm saying? Trying to put it together. There's 1,800 pieces in this thing and many of them are very, very small. And I got so much of it put together and ran into trouble. And I, I tell you, I, I, to be honest, I felt like sinking the Titanic all over again. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? There's a song, a country song, it says, Jesus, take the wheel. You know what I was praying? Jesus, take the keel, all right? Because my patience was running low, especially when parts start breaking off and then I had to repeat process over. I was like, Lord, please, you know, come now. All right. But maybe there's someone who can relate to, you know, what I'm saying here this morning. Out of all the fruit of the Spirit uh, in my life, patience is one that is a seedling. It's still forming. God is still working on me. And you know, and in like manner, pain is something that I don't particularly enjoy as well. There are all kinds of things that can bring pain into our lives. I, I once had a kidney stone. I've had gallstones, I've had kidney stones, and uh, it was the most painful thing. If you ever had a kidney stone, uh, there's different levels, there's different ones that you can, you know, in the sense of some can be really bad, this is really bad. I've driven nails up my feet. I have had been knocked out on a few occasions playing sports. I split my head open. You can't see it now. I shaved my head. But right here, if I don't, you'll see a line. I split my head open when I was five, had, uh, when, I, when I was playing wrestling with my brother. Um, uh, I, I almost chopped my thumb off. I've got about 11 stitches that was here. And when I picked it up, you can see the notch in the bone. I almost chopped my thumb off with an ax while making splits. These were all painful. I had other things on the go. I see some of you smiling and laughing, maybe either at my expense or you, you know what it's like to go through. Or Anyways. But, uh, you know, when I had that kidney stone, it, it, it was bad. I know the person, it was a board member in a previous church. My wife called him up and said, you got to bring this Rob to the hospital. And uh, I kept apologizing. I'm sorry. I'm so, I'm so sorry. I'm trying to be a man. I'm trying to, <laughs> I apologize. I'm apologizing that I can't take this. And I was like squirming. And I was in the car and I, was, I just couldn't get to a comfortable spot. I was just like, you know, I didn't cry, but I was as close to crying. I was gritting my teeth. I was doing everything to try. If you ever had a kidney stone, uh, you know what I'm talking about. And, uh, when, you know, okay, I need some compassion. When, my, when I got home out of this, all right, got home, everything went the way it was supposed to. Um, when I walked in the door, my wife was smiling, not because she was happy to see me, which I thought she, you know, she was smiling because she told me after that sometimes kidney stones uh, can be as close as for men to, as close to childbirth that men can experience. We can't experience childbirth, but we can have some very bad kidney stones. I don't know, for the nurses in the room, maybe you can, you can confirm that. I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor nurse. But anyways, it's just, she was smiling, happy as a lark, singing. And uh, anyways, glad to see me home. But anyways, pray for me. But uh, you, may, <laughs> you may not experience my pain, and I may not experience your pain, but pain is sure to be something that we both experience in our lives one way or the other. And let me encourage you, either you have experienced pain in the past and suffering, or you're going through a painful experience right now, 
or if you haven't, you will go through a painful experience or suffering of some type in your life because, you know, it's a part of life, whether physical pain, emotional pain, whatever it is, it's a part of life. And, you know, when you look at Jesus' life, Jesus didn't escape this world by pain and suffering either, right? He himself uh, experienced pain and suffering. And he told his disciples an encouraging word. I don't think you got too, much, too many amens about it, but he said, in this life, now you got amens on the latter part of the verse, but in the first part he says, in this life you will have trouble. We speak about the promises of God. How is that for a promise? You know, a lot of us don't want to name and claim that promise. But uh, in this life you will have trouble. And that was true in the lives of those believers and in the lives of the disciples. And as in the lives of these folk that's in this text that James was writing to, they had encountered persecution and hardship. They had been oppressed, especially by some ungodly rich folks, as we can see in the verse, uh, first six verses of chapter 5. It's not the problem when they had money. The problem was that money had them, but that's a whole other sermon, and we can get into that in another time. And James' counsel to them was to respond to pain and suffering, to difficult circumstances with patience and perseverance. And as I was doing some study, I, I come to find out that the word that James uses in the Greek is a combo of, uh, for, for pain, for suffering, uh, is a combo of two uh, Greek words, makros, which means long, and, and thymos, which is passion or anger, sometimes translated as long suffering. All right? Scholars tell us that it has the idea of waiting sufficient time before expressing anger. It describes the attitude of self-restraint that does not try to get uh, even for a wrong that was done. It embraces steadfastness and staying power. It is used of God himself who's long-suffering. Indeed, only the Lord produces it in us, and hence it is a fruit of the Spirit. F.F. Bruce said, if in the English we have the adjective long-tempered, if we had that, as a counterpart to short-tempered, then macrothymia could be, called the qual- could be called the quality of being long-tempered. Anybody long-tempered this morning? <laughs> you want to raise your hand or short-tempered? Being long-tempered, which is a quality of God. You see, when we respond to pain and problems with patience, we develop perseverance. And when we're able to persevere, no matter what life throws at us, We position ourselves to live out our God-given purpose, and we bring him glory. Let me respond. Let me read that again. When we respond to pain and problems with patience, we develop perseverance, and we position ourselves to live out our God-given purpose. Let me add on there, and we give God the glory. And like I said, I could end that message right here, because if you get that truth into your spirit, if I can get that in my spirit, you know, it will change our lives. And James was doing his level best to convey that, that message to these believers who had gone through, like I said, some difficult circumstances. They, and to encourage them to practice patience and to practice uh, long, uh, long suffering. He connected it to a future event, the coming of the Lord. He said in verse 7, be patient until the coming of the Lord. He said in verse 8, be patient for the coming of the Lord is near. And you might be asking, why is he connecting these two things? He's connecting these two things because, as one scholar noted, patience has a specific hope in Christ's return. They say the future return of Christ is the event that motivates Christians to persevere in the endurance of suffering. This is not always an amen message, you know what I'm saying? It's it's a challenge. But you see, James is trying to get them to not look at the present challenges, but a future hope. And that hope is in Jesus Christ. That hope is in Christ's coming. That hope is being with him forever. That hope is eternal. Let Let me relate what he's saying to you where you are today. You might be in high school. You might be in university. You might be in in, in graduate school or college, or some other training institution, and you're encountering difficulties of various things. Could be financial, could be academic, whatever it would be. No doubt in your educational journey, you have faced a lot of challenges. You have faced and will face before you get to that finish line. But for all your troubles, if you can persevere despite what you have to go through, despite difficult things that you have to face, there is coming a day when you will walk the line. There is coming a day when you will graduate. We just celebrated a couple weeks ago our graduates who persevered through challenges, 
and end up graduating. Or another example for those of you who are working right now. If you're, if you're, if you're retired, God bless you. I pray that this is a wonderful retirement for you. But for those who are still working and, and, and going to work day by day, um, you know, working has its own set of troubles. Regardless if you love your job, regardless if you, you don't want money to come or whatever it would be, working has its own set of troubles. But if you are patient and can learn to persevere despite what you must face from day to day to day, there's coming a day when, Lord willing, uh, 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 you will retire. And that season of your life will come to a conclusion. And, of course, when you retire, it has its own set of difficult uh, things and challenges. The key to persevering is to focus on your future hope and not your present troubles. The key to persevering is to focus on our future hope and not our present troubles, whatever they may be. And James is trying to shift their focus on the future and not the present because if he can shift their focus on the end goal, they will be able to push, uh, to persevere through the challenges that are before them and to encourage them to be patient in the midst of pain. James uses three illustrations. The first is of a farmer. He said the farmer waits for the precious products of the soil, being, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is near. Scholars tell us that during this time, uh, the early rains came in October and November. And, and soon after the rain, a grain was sown. The latter rains came in April and May. That's what the season was like. As the grain was maturing, and both the rainy, these rainy seasons were necessary for a successful crop. And knowing this, the farmer was willing to wait patiently until both rains came and provided the needed moisture that was required for harvest. All the plowing and planting and weeding would have been, would have been pointless if, if the farmer could not have a hope that these rains were coming. Let me, let me take it a little bit deeper. In the Old Testament, uh, which, with which this Jewish Christian audience would have been familiar with, the early rain and the latter rain uh, is a standard um, testament image of God's promise faithfulness. All right? You can see it in passages like Joel 2.23, which says, So shout for joy, you sons of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given what? You the early rain and, uh, uh, for your vindication, and he has brought down for you the rain, the early rain and the latter rain as before. We also see it in another text, and there's others, but I want to bring in a couple just so you can get it. Uh, Deuteronomy 11 and 13 and 14, and it shall come to pass. Moses writes this, that if you listen obediently to my commandments, which I am commanding you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and soul, that he will provide rain in your season, rain for your land in its season, the early rain and late rain. He says, so that you may gather your grain, your new wine, and your oil. So what, what is James trying to say through all this? What point is he trying to make? He's trying to highlight the importance of being patient. Because like a natural harvest that will come if we do our part for faithful, practicing patience reaps the spiritual harvest of a deepened, mature Christian character. And he is bringing home the reality that just as God promised these rains for the faithful farmer so, uh, who have patiently labored, so too will God uh, has promised the coming of Christ to those who have faithfully followed him and labored and trusted in God. As one scholar says, here then is the secret of endurance. When the going is tough, God is producing a harvest in our lives. Let me ask you this. What is God producing in you in this season of your life? You may be facing trials, tribulations, troubles, hardships. You may leave this door, walk into a situation that's difficult. But what is God producing in you through that, in this difficult season in your life? You know, even though God doesn't cause these things to happen, he certainly uses them to grow our faith, to mold us, to shape us into who he desires us to be. Church, don't focus on the problem. It's so easy to get caught up in what's around you is right in your face. Don't focus on the pain. That's either external, internal. 
but focus on how God will use it to produce a harvest that will not only bless you and mold you into who he wants you to be, but that will bless others as well and will accomplish his plan, his purpose, and his will. And so he talks about the farmer. Secondly, he talks about the prophets. Uses them as an example. He said in verse 10 and 11, as an example, brothers and sisters, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. In the first illustration, he connects patience with the Lord's coming, but here he connects patience and suffering with blessing. Using the prophets as an example, and Jesus did this as well. In Matthew 5 and 12, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Blessed are those who have, persecuted, who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is in heaven, for your reward in heaven is great. And he says, For in this same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Church, there's a blessing that comes from enduring and persevering through suffering and pain. Now, when James uses the word suffering, he uses the word uh, kakopathia, which scholars uh, say can have a passive sense in the sense of misery that comes upon a person in general, but it is, it is here used, uh, it is used in a more active sense to describe the deliberate endurance that a person practices in hardship. And so that is what James is referring to in this text. They push through a variety of challenges and and to reveal the goodness and faithfulness of God. They, they also reveal the compassion and mercy of God who cares for us when we go through sufferings for his name's sake. For example, if you consider the prophet Elijah, we've spoke about Elijah many, many times. I love the prophet Elijah who stood up to wicked king Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel and told him that a drought was coming upon the land. He, he, he prophesied to them and he ends up having to flee himself for risking of his life. And, but you know what? Elijah didn't escape the drought. Elijah was in the drought as well, just like everybody else. But you know what? During it all, God protected him. God provided for his needs. God fed him by ravens who brought him food and led him to a brook where he, where he had a source of water. There's much more to the story. Don't have time for it today. But in the end, you know what happened? God gave victory over his enemy, over Haiab. And God used him to, to call, uh, to be a vessel that God would call Elisha, who would step up and move forward in the next generation and do greater and greater things than Elijah ever did. Or consider the prophet Jeremiah who was arrested as a traitor and even thrown into an abandoned well to die. Uh, but like Elijah, God fed him and provided for him and protected him throughout the terrible siege of Jerusalem. Or consider Daniel. Some of you may know the story. One of my favorites, I was reading through Daniel the last uh, few weeks. It's come to a close now, but I was studying Daniel. and He was exiled from his home, taken from his home, brought to a foreign land, but ended up in a den of lions. Looked like everything was coming to an end in his life. Looked like his life was surely over. But God was faithful to him and rescued him out of that pit and, and, and used his circumstances for God's glory and to point people to God. Being prophets, they spoke for God. They were God's messengers. They were God's mouthpieces. But you know what? This morning, through their patience and suffering, through their perseverance and continual trust in God, their lives backed up, and this is so important this morning, their lives backed up their messages and spoke louder than their voices ever could have. You know, sometimes, you know, public speaking is one of the, one of the greatest fears people can have. You don't have to get up and publicly speak. Your life can shout that God is faithful no matter what as you respond to circumstances in a way that James is pointing to. As Warren Wearsby says, the impact of a faithful, godly life carries much power. And we need to remind ourselves that our patience and suffering is a testimony to others around us. And finally, the final illustration that James, James uses is Job. The second half of verse 11 says, you have heard of the endurance of Job. And have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and merciful. And the word here in the Greek that James uses is hypomone, which, which means uh, perseverance in difficult circumstances. You know, Job, if you know anything about Job, he's probably most, the most well-known example. You hear about the people say you have the patience of Job. Even if you don't know the full story, do you know that one-liner, you know? 
In the first three chapters of Job, here he, here's what he loses. Think he got it rough? He loses all of his kids. He loses his health. He loses his wealth. And the only thing he has to cling on to is his wife. And she is not encouraging this to hold on. She's like, you know, just curse God and die. But he wouldn't. And for most of the book, he is defending himself, defending his integrity, defending his trust in God, defending his character against so-called friends that were saying, you know, whatever's in your life, get rid of it and get, you know, uh, confess your sin and you know, all this kind of stuff. And Job's like, man, I'm an innocent man. I didn't do anything to deserve this. And in the final four chapters of Job, we see his deliverance. And in the end, God honors him and gives him a double portion of what he had. Gives him twice as much as he had before. And from the example of Job and the example of the prophets, we're left with what one scholar George Stulak notes, which is this. Three elements. Three elements that make up the portrait of patience at work in the believer's life are suffering, perseverance, and blessing. He says, James wants his readers to understand that these three develop in succession and their outcome is as definite as the character of God. He says, suffering enters the believer's life, number one. Number two, perseverance is the believer's response. And so suffering comes, perseverance is the believer's response, and blessing comes from the Lord who is full of compassion and mercy. Some of you may know what I'm talking about this morning. And the main thing or the main takeaway that James wants them to know uh, uh, is this. As we respond to suffering with pain and pain with perseverance, God responds to our perseverance with his blessing because that is who he is. That is his character, his nature, and that is what he does. Now, that blessing, sometimes when we use the word blessing, we're, we're thinking about bank account. Sometimes that's because, we, you know, it was on TV, Prosperity Gospel, all this stuff going on. But I'm not, I'm not speaking about that. That blessing could be that, but it could be peace. When you can have a peace, you don't know where it comes from. You say, I, you ever have someone say, I'm praying for you? And you say, yeah, I can certainly feel it. I've certainly got strength. I don't know where it came from. That blessing could be provision. That God shows up and provides you with what you're praying for. It might be like Paul that he doesn't take the thorn from you, but he gives you what you need to get through it. That blessing could be deliverance. That blessing could be, could be joy, as we sang before, that you got joy when you have no you know, reason to have it. That blessing could be victory. That blessing could be heaven. Maybe it takes you up to eternity. And you don't get, you don't perceive that you've received the answer to prayer this side of heaven, but he takes you there. That blessing, and this is a true blessing, one that I've experienced in my own life, that blessing could be that God uses you. You know, it's always more powerful when you come up to say, and someone um, can say something to you, and you say, you know what, I've been there. That blessing could be that God uses your circumstance to touch someone else who's gone through or going through or will go through that exact same circumstance. That blessing could be any number of things. You see, no matter what we face, good or bad, we can be confident in the unchanging character and nature of God, our Heavenly Father, who is always faithful, always merciful, always gracious, always loving, always present with us along the journey, whether it takes us up on the mountaintop or down in the valley or both at different seasons of our life. The description of God being, as being compassionate, merciful would have been very familiar to these believers. They, they would have known scripture after scripture that spoke about that. They would have known what the psalmist said in Psalm 103 and 8, which says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. They would have known what God spoke to the people in Exodus 34 and 6 when he said, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in faithfulness and truth. And as one scholar says, uh, uh, James places unique emphasis on this picture of God by introducing a new term. Nowhere else seen in the New Testament. Polyspinachos, or something along those lines. It means full of compassion. Brand new terminology. He puts it out there. And this ultimately is a source of assurance by which we can 
Be patient. What will it look like when we uh, practice Christian patience? It will look like the prophets who kept on speaking. It will look like Job who kept on believing in suffering and perseverance with this specific assurance that God will bless. And there's all sorts of ways that he can do that. I'm asking the worship team to return as I begin to uh, uh, conclude this message. And I want to conclude as James concludes. He concludes by returning. He's reminding them about what he opened his letter with, which had the very same thing. Your suffering, perseverance, and blessing. Suffering, perseverance, and blessing. James 1, 2, and 4. Here, just, you'll hear it in here. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, considering it an opportunity, he's saying persevere, for a great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect, complete, and needing nothing. How, how do we respond, church, when we go through difficult seasons in our lives? How do we respond to pain and problems and hardships and suffering? We respond like the farmer did, who kept on working, who kept on believing in the faithfulness and goodness of God, the provision of God. We respond like the prophets did and keep on speaking the truth of God, no matter what, and trusting that he will deliver, that he will with, be with us to give us what we need to get through. We respond like Job did. Like I said, keep on believing. We sing it so easy. Sometimes keep on believing the goodness of God and trusting in his mercy and trusting in his compassion, trusting in his nature that he is who, who he says he is and he will do what he says he will do. We respond with perseverance and trust that in the end, God will ultimately accomplish his good purposes in us and through us and lead us into his blessing. You know, there's some people in this room as I look around and I saw you during the preaching, I can see faces and I can see situations and I know some of you can attest to this. You, you've gone through these things and you can say, yeah, pastor, that is right. I've gone through pain. I've persevered through it and God showed up and God's with me. And there's some here today, maybe you're in the process of pain right now and you're wondering what to do. I want to encourage you or you're persevering and you're saying, pastor, you know, I don't see the end coming yet. I don't, I don't feel like I've got that blessing yet. I want to encourage you to keep on trusting, keep on going, keep on persevering because we have a hope. You know what that hope is, as James said? We have seen, you look through scripture, you look in other people's lives, the hope is that we have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings in others and we know that the Lord is full of compassion. We know that the Lord is full of mercy. Then, now, and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank that it is a source of strength, a source of truth, that you speak through it to touch our hearts, and touch our lives. I pray over everyone that's here this morning, maybe someone that will tune in online. You know every situation, every person. And I pray over those that have gone through these things. We pray to continue strength upon their lives, your continued hand of blessing. For those that are just coming into face to face with pain, I pray that you would help them not to throw in the towel in faith, but Father, because of faith and because of you, to persevere, even if you don't see that end, to persevere with that hope, even if you don't see it, because faith is not the substance of things seen. It's not what we see. It's the things unseen. So, Father, I just pray that you be with those who's dealing with pain and persevering. Give them the strength to continue on. That they may know that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful and is able to be used as a vessel in your hands to touch others 
who are going through that same thing. In Jesus' name, amen. Team's gonna lead in a second. If I can share a quick story. I, I, the last few years I've been going through, and some of you know I've been going through epilepsy and the whole journey with that. Um, but how many know the physical uh, uh, affects the mental, affects uh, other things? And after having gone through, you know, you have one and then you lose your license for a number of months and that's, that's a whole set of challenges with small kids, all that kind of stuff. You know, you ha- the pain is one thing, the recovery is one thing, but then there's all sorts of other things. You deal with that, you're strong enough. You can do it again and then it happens again and then it happens again and it starts over a period of years. It starts, it's like a, in a boxing match. You know, you can take a few punches, but when you get into later rounds, you're starting to, it starts to hurt. It starts to do more damage. And I remember saying, man, if I have another one, I'm gonna lose my mind. I'm gonna lose it because it's, it's such a challenge. And I can be transparent. Maybe I'm gonna speak to someone here this morning. Had another one. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness. Go through this again. Went eight months without being able to drive a vehicle, small children, wife work, everything on the go. Sales and Canadian Tire can't go unless I walk. You know what I mean? It's all the stuff on the go. And I remember, for those of you who are going through something right now and you feel that you can't, you're going to throw your towel in on faith. Let me encourage you, because I'm Rob. You call me Pastor Rob a lot of times, but I'm Rob. I've been Rob all my life. Pastor is something I had later on. This is what you got to do. I remember there was times in my life when I took some time off and a season off, and I needed that. I didn't think I needed it, but I needed it. And I thank you for our leadership here that was able to walk with me. And I remember I, a lot of times I, I got to a point where, you know, I didn't really want to be around people, and I'm a connections pastor. Fortunately, the pandemic was on the go, so most of the time the building was shut down, things were on the go, we're online and manage that, but that's not my personality, is it? And, uh, you know, I went through a season where I didn't know what was going on. I started to shake. I felt like I was having a heart attack. I didn't know what was going on. I went to the doctor. He said, you, you got PTSD. You got anxiety. I was like, what are you talking about? I never had anxiety in my life. What's all that about? And I remember there was a whole process with that. But I remember going for walks. And I used to go for walks. For one, I needed the exercise. Number two, I just needed that, that space. I used to take up my earbuds and I'd turn on sermons, not feeling a thing, feeling completely cold, feeling nothing. Sometimes I'd cry because I felt nothing. I'm not a crier, but because I didn't feel anything, I listened to worship and I fed, force fed myself. Worship and the word, worship and the word. And you know what? I, you know, it was a long season. Maybe you're in this. I want to tell you, if you persevere, and it's not in your own strength. If you persevere, blessing comes. I assure you, blessing comes. Does just, just challenges still happen? Most definitely. I was up here once going to preach, and I was in the middle of preaching, and I couldn't read for about a minute because my brain <laughs> went out of concussions, and you guys didn't know it. I, I said, we're going to stop and pray. You guys didn't know anything. I still have those fears of coming up here, but the devil is a liar, Right? I got the word in today. Here we go. But if you're in it, he's faithful. I can tell you, man, I'm on the other side of that now. I'm walking in the Lord's blessing. I'm thankful for that. But just as I'm walking in it right now, not perfect, you can too. You know why? Because he's full of compassion and merciful then, now, and always. God bless you.